Thanks very much, Alistair. Enjoy it. First, uh, let me uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to participate uh, in, this, uh, in this day and uh, congratulate them on their initiative and uh, courage in tackling a very important set of issues. Um, as uh, Alessandro said a moment ago, I'm, um, I'm speaking to you today um, on uh, the, uh, some legal uh, dimensions of the uh, case for Internet access as a human right. Uh, I uh, do so not as a university president. Um, in fact, I'm convinced if my colleagues knew that I was speaking on any substantive issue by virtue of my, uh, of my standing as a university president, I'd be uniquely unqualified. So it is not in that capacity I'm here today, but rather as someone who for a number of years has been both a student of and a uh, participant in a number of different initiatives designed to mediate between the benefits of capitalizing on the ingenuity, the creativity, the efficiency of the private sector, of the market, and the need for government to play a fundamental role in brokering, overseeing, uh, setting the terms of, um, of engagement in that context. And seeing that um, in so many different domains, although there's often, particularly on the part of economists, great enthusiasm for what the market can do, uh, very often there is a uh, discreditation or at least a marginalization of the role that government plays and making sure that those, uh, those remits to the private sector work well. And not only that, and this is my bias as a law professor, as a one-time law professor, I'm not, I should say at the outset, a human rights expert, but I am someone who has thought uh, for a number of years about uh, the role that law and legal institutions play in undergirding a lot of these desired changes. And here, my argument is that uh, the quality of the institutions, how you think about the role of the state and its institutions is really important in determining, again, whether what we're trying to achieve is in fact achieved or whether in fact what you end up with are broad aspirations but no delivery. So that's a perspective I bring here today. And I think that this is important for the discussion uh, we have today in thinking hard about the role of the state because the human rights we're discussing don't exist, of course, in abstract. They're not freestanding principles. They're designed to operate against states and compel them to act or to refrain from acting. And so in considering the capacity of the right that we're debating here today, uh, we need to uh, ensure that, um, that, uh, that the state is, and the state's role is evaluated in two crucial respects. First is uh, the right, how is the right going to be designed to compel action on behalf of the state? But, and what is the actual nature of the action that is being compelled? Uh, so again, really focusing on what is the meaning, whether we frame this as a right or as a claim or as a priority, what is the content of it? And secondly, um, once we decide what the content of that obligation is, uh, what will be the capacity of the state in question to make good on this new obligation? So again, content and implementation and implementation capacity. Let me uh, talk briefly, and again, it's been cavanced well, I think, in the last uh, several sessions, so, uh, um, so I'm not going to dwell on this in detail. But I think in thinking about the content of the right of access, we have to be really precise about what we're talking about, because when you look at the literature on the nature of those who would advocate for internet access as a right, there are several different things that are being contemplated. And again, to the extent we're having a normative moment here, we should be really clear about what we're talking about and be subtle in, um, in what it is that we're claiming. So um, are we um, talking about merely the, in, the right to connect to the internet? Again, just seeing this as a right of connection. Um, are we thinking about this, as some scholars have, as a right to be free from disruption of internet access? This right relates to the ability to keep your access to the internet once you're able to connect. So this is a second order uh, issue. And here you can think of the Egyptian revolution in 2011, and when the authorities killed the entire country's web access prior to a large uh, protest march that was planned. Um, so again, the fact that 
the internet was disrupted in that context. Is that what we're talking about? Third, of course, uh, there are rights to free expression, privacy, and other rights to the content of the internet that, um, of course, pertain to what you do online once you're there. And again, think of governments that engage in censorship or surveillance of their citizens' activities online, particularly in the case of dissidents. And again, how does the right operate in those cases? These are, are concepts that are, are in some sense connected, but they are distinct, and I think we should, uh, we should be clear what it is we're uh, talking about and what context we're talking about. Once we decide um, on the, um, uh, on the stage of, uh, of connectivity uh, that we're going to focus on, then there's a whole host of other issues that have been referred to in previous speakers about what this actually, this right or claim actually means. Do we meet a right of access of any sort, no matter how slow or ineffective um, or their minimal standards on the speed and reliability of that access? What about the cost? Uh, do we in fact mean the right of access to an affordable internet? Do we want to say that individuals must have access to all of the information available on the internet or is it sufficient that we guarantee only a portion of that information uh, or that information only in a particular form, perhaps the portion that can be sent for least cost as in the zero rating debate? And while we're at it, does the right include only the ability to access or read information, or do we want to guarantee the ability to create, engage, and produce for distribution on the net? Um, and then finally, of course, is the issue of, as we define this right, while individuals may have a right to the internet, the question is, against whom is this right exercised? Do citizens have a claim to the internet as against their own government? That is. Is the government obliged only to provide the human right of internet to its own people? Or is there some broader obligation, as I sense is um, very much implicit in some of the things that have been said today, to facilitate other countries in their efforts to provide access to their citizens? And if so, what is the content of this additional obligation? And of course, any time lawyers think about rights or claims, you think, as was said earlier, what are the remedies to enforce these claims or right? So all of these things, I think, are quite important in the discussion we're having. And I think also the connection that uh, a number of the speakers before me have made today in terms of the normative foundations for this right and continually coming back to this issue of, given that it's somewhat uh, novel to be making a rights claim around a particular technology, um, a means, to use Nick's word, what is it that makes this particular technology, this moment, that so unique that actually elevates it to right status? And again, because we're having an, a normative moment, I think the more that we can put flesh on the bones of what we mean and why it's important, that does a lot of the work, I think, of helping advance uh, the, uh, the cause, the claims that we're all discussing today. Let me just for a few moments uh, leave aside the nature of the right we're discussing and consider the implementation of this right. And this is a complicated issue from the outset because, again, human rights operate against states. That is, a citizen does not have a right to compel a private communications provider to act, but, of course, the implementation of the right to the internet will not only involve states, but a wide range of other actors most prominently a range of private companies, all with different interests. And so uh, when we pivot from rights, definition of rights to implementation, we need to widen our lens. And uh, while we do so, consider what roles states must play in the implementation of the human right, what role should states play, and to what degree should they simply cede their terrain to other actors. And one thing I think is helpful at least for me in thinking about these types of issues and to uh, think about the respective role of state and market participants is, you know, why haven't states in many jurisdictions acted to implement this right, to advance this claim? What are the barriers? Why do we need a new right at all? And here, you know, just very quickly, I would say this raises a number of issues. Is it resources? 
Um, is it that simply that the state does not have the capacity to adopt the right in the manner suggested by, the propon by its proponents? Um, and it's not just a question of resources in absolute terms, it may also be framed in relative terms. One might argue that states can certainly provide some level of access, and so the real f reason for failing to provide access is disinclination. That is, the state simply refuses to prioritize the fulfillment of the right. A well-intentioned state may decide, given their stage of development, and confronted for other demands from their citizenry, for health care, for education, to shelter, to safety, that this is not the most compelling priority for the state. That is, that is, that is a legitimate process, one can imagine, in a number of different contexts. But of course, there's other cases that are far uh, less uh, legitimate and raise questions about those states who are seeking to limit political and civil liberties of their citizenry. And that's a reason why, even in the uh, presence of resources they could have to deploy to this priority, they choose not to. Let me just go to a third issue which um, I want to close out on because I think it's so important for this discussion and again something that in my years uh, involved in various uh, regulation uh, or deregulation privatization uh, related um, endeavors is important I think to bear in mind. And that is that um, ultimately we have to think even in a setting where you have a strong state inclination to act and there is uh, some level of resources that it could mobilize to be able to act, there's still very significant and daunting questions, as many people in this room, of course, well know and far more learned on this than I am, but that is the state's capacity to discharge its various public obligations in overseeing, supporting the creation of these rights of access. Um, and uh, here again, I find very often you know, there's a sense to see the market solution the, as being um, almost something that happens spontaneously and states just get out of the way. But the truth of the matter is that there are so many deep issues that this right claim will raise that require state capacity to sort out. Um, the state's going to need to figure out what are the ground rules for entry by the private sector if they decide to rely on the private sector to deliver the right. Will the state promote competition and open access? Or will they impose in some parts of the network or the downstream access to consumers barriers to entry? What are the basis on which those barriers will be erected? Will domestic suppliers be favored over foreign ones? Or will considerations of financial capacity and uh, technical expertise and innovative capacity prevail? Will the state favor an open and transparent regulatory structure, or will it uh, give in to corruption and backroom deals? How do we address endemic concerns over complex contracts and bids, and how compliance with how the bids are awarded and monitored, and what obligations the state imposes on those bids? Years ago, I spent a fair amount of time looking in uh, the context of both the developing and the developing world a lot of the enthusiasm that then existed in the first wave of public-private partnerships. And again, there was at that moment a real sense that don't worry, the state just has to have a much more marginal role and the private sector will take care of itself. Well, it turned out again that the failure to understand the centrality of public goals, values, and the role of the state meant that a lot of those fierce ventures that got off the ground discredited the state and ended up creating very significant public backlash. Let me just uh, then, with all of this said, just uh, close out on a few themes. You know, one is that given this is, as I referred to a moment ago, a moment when we understand what we're doing here today about creating norms and asserting the case for the norms, I think keep going back to what is it that is distinctive about this technology in this moment that justifies accelerating or heightening the value of this particular claim. And again, I think there's lots that I've heard today in terms of this is a technology that allows production and consumption. This is a, this is a technology that is so critical in terms of rights of livelihood, of education, political and civic uh, participation. 
Um, I think, again, uh, as we define the right, one of the, the, one of the issues I think is really important for us is not to feel duty-bound to end up with a um, short sort of assertion, just a sound bite. But rather, I think, if this is a day in which we have all uh, these various perspectives, um, that we should take this opportunity to argue for the right or the claim, however it is declared, with some subtlety. That is to say, as Jeff Sachs so pointedly uh, remarked a few moments ago, this is a technology that is incredibly powerful and are related to a number of core human rights that have long been recognized. In some sense, it is a derivative right of a number of other claims that we have. But so too, this is a technology that as we have seen, whether we're talking about the American electoral process, whether we're talking about human trafficking as referred to earlier, whether we're talking about distribution of opiates, um, or whether we're even talking about the capacity to engage in levels of ethnic cleansing and genocide that I dare say would be almost inconceivable without this technology. There is a dark side here that we must worry about. And again, I think to the extent that right from the get-go, we're acknowledging the kinds of benefits that we seek to um, achieve through this, it's important, but also be very attentive to the downside risk and to make it clear what we're not, what we're not advocating for. Let me finally say that, um, as uh, hopefully was clear from my remarks, that in thinking about this, uh, right, and I, uh, again, there's a lot of people here who have done some amazing things with technology and broadening access, and um, I understand the thrall of this, uh, but I still don't think it is easy to sidestep or marginalize the state. Even the idea that we would be able to put satellites, or balloon, whatever, in, in, uh, in celestial space and imagine because that's out of the strict and longstanding uh, legal uh, um, criteria for state jurisdiction doesn't mean the state is going to go away. The state is a critical port participant in this, and I think that uh, we have to think a lot about as this right or claim gets operationalized, how do we make states capable of dealing with all the subtle and complex issues that they're responsible for mediating um, in discharging these responsibilities. And again, I think this is a strong case for how we can see transfer expertise, technical support, uh, best practices that become an important vehicle for states ultimately who are the target of this right or claim to properly discharging their responsibility.